Okay, finally for this morning session, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our honorees and also the person who wrote the best abstract for this meeting, <laughs> Carl Hylas, who will tell us about 498 H1 Zeeman measurements, a holistic a synthesis. All right. Uh, first, I want to show the last slide in my presentation. And I should be able, how do I do that? How do I skip to the end? It's a Mac, so I don't know anything about Macs. Uh, go up, that one. So I'd like to make, make an announcement. Uh, Twelve years ago, there was a party like this at Arecibo. My lovely wife, Patricia Vader, made a, a video. Some of you have seen that video. Some of had, I've had requests to see it again. Well, this is your chance at lunchtime. The original video has been embellished with excerpts from talks by various people at that meeting. So it's some of it's brand new, never been seen before, and never will be seen again. Uh, because she doesn't want to post it on the internet because it uses copyrighted material and she's desperately worried about getting sued and then deported. Uh, so if you want to if you want to see that video it'll last almost an hour. Have your lunch in this room otherwise have your lunch outside. And of course you're free to leave whenever you want. Now how do we get to the beginning? Thank you. OK. So uh, it says 498. Now, that's somewhat of a, an overestimate, because that includes positions where the magnetic field was not really detected. Uh, so that number drops by about a factor of two if you include only detections. So the li title is somewhat of a lie, but nevertheless, uh, first of all, why do we want to bother with magnetic fields anyway uh, in, the, in the neutral region, neutral medium? And well, we've, we've seen things like this before when you look at the morphology of the neutral gas and compare it with the morphology of the starlight polarization, which outlines the perpendicular component of magnetic field on the sky. Uh, there's a remarkable correlation, and it's very Detail extends all kinds of scales, like right in here, for example, down in there, wherever you look. Uh, the interstellar magnetic field is parallel to these large scale morphological features in the diffuse gas. It changes when you go to molecular gas, but that's how I concentrate on the diffuse gas. Uh, so, we see this morphological connection, but is it the gas that's connected to the field, or is it the field that's connected to the gas? And the way to answer that is to determine how strong the field is compared to the gas pressure. How do you measure the strength of the field? Well, there's only one real way, and that's the, the, the Zeeman effect, because that gives you the strength of the field directly, or at least one component of it. A second way to do it is Faraday rotation, which also gives you the magnetic field, but it's also weighted by the electron volume density. So it's somewhat of a biased estimate. So one of the things in this talk will be to compare the somewhat uh, the uh, two hundred odd measurements of Zeeman effect with Faraday rotation. We'll see what what comes out of that. Uh, we can measure Zeeman splitting in two ways in the 21 centimeter line. One is absorption, one is emission. Uh, Tom and, and I did the, uh, did the absorption measurement uh, at, with the Millennium Survey at Arecibo, and in there we found this quick summary statement, the total magnetic field from absorption measurements is, a, is about six microgauss. That's 
sort of a median estimate from the statistical result pointed towards something like 40 sources. Uh, how about emission? Well, the history of emission started with Tom as a graduate student of mine, and we worked with the Hat Creek Telescope. Uh, we had a lot of fun going up to the feed, and you might notice on this, uh, on these feed legs, there's this bushy stuff on the feed legs that's absorbing material. We did all kinds of stuff to make that telescope reliable for Zeeman splitting measurements in emission. And Tom went on and uh, started collaborating with Dick Crutcher to do denser regions, and, and they made a, a real enterprise of that. And it's those two really together that uh, really defined the status and the activities uh, for dense gas, molecular gas. And they deserve a lot of credit for that. And along the way, of course, they collaborated with a lot of people, some of whom were in this room, and in particular, Adit Falgaron, uh, with those famous measurements of CN in the very dense molecular gas. Well, I kept on doing the same old thing until 1993. And this is what greeted my eyes when I drove up there on the night of January 23rd, or whenever it was, in 1993. Uh, it had been very windy driving up Route 5. When I got to the Lassen Peak Pass, there were branches all over the road. A tree had fallen down over the road. And uh, I was wondering what would happen to when I drove into the telescope. And that's what greeted my eyes. Anyway, over that 10 years, uh, we published a number of papers with various people, Alyssa Goodman, uh, some sole author papers, some other people here. Uh, 429 positions. Not all of them which were detections, some were upper limits. And for this talk, I'm restricting myself only to those statistically significant detections, meaning delta B over B less than three less than a third, and also I'm eliminating any result for which the line width exceeds eight kilometers per second because I don't trust those. Anyway, this is a plot on the sky of where all those are, and you don't have to spend too much time looking at that because I'm going to go into this in a little more detail as we go on. The summary statement for all those positions in emission is that the B sub Zeeman uh, which is the line of sight component that you measure from the Zeeman splitting effect, is about six microgauss. And uh, that six microgauss is suspiciously the same as the six microgauss for absorption, but this is line of sight, and the absorption was total. They're related by a factor of two, so the line of sight here, if you convert it to total, the six becomes 12. And the reason, I think, why we see stronger fields in emission is, first of all, we only use those results where the field is strong because we want to have del B over delta B greater than 3. And second of all, we selectively select positions where the morphology of the 21 centimeter line structure in the sky is interesting, meaning there are filaments where the field has likely to be been amplified. Anyway, here's another map of the field of, uh, and now this is 197 components, I think it is, where the field is actually, where I've applied that field, that filter, so the field results are reliable. And here the uh, diamond indicates positive magnetic fields, that magnetic field is pointed away from us. The squares indicate negative magnetic fields point, pointed towards us. And I'm going to, in the next slide, compare these to Faraday rotation. And all of these points agree in terms of the field direction, except for some of them in, shown in red, which are the nonconformists, in which case the field direction implied for them disagrees from that of the associated Faraday rotation. 
And so I call those points nonconformists, and uh, I personally love nonconformity. Uh, that's why I married my, my wife, who made that video, which is nonconformist, and why I've sort of led the life I've been able to lead without too much administrative responsibility except in the last few years. Uh, anyway, what can we make of that set of measurements? Well, I want to compare them with Faraday rotation. And this is something that could not have been done previous to, to 2010. Because in 2009, this was the latest state of the art by Oren and Wolf, 499 Faraday rotations scattered on the sky more or less randomly. And if you want to compare those with my 200, well, the overlap of 200 points on here with those 500 points, is, there's just not enough overlap of those points to be able to say anything. But in 2009, we had the generation of the so-called NVSS catalog of Faraday rotations, which was done by uh, uh, Taylor Still and, and Summerstrom. Uh, and here we plot all of those sources on the sky, all 40,000 of all 37,543 of them, I should say, where the uh, Faraday rotation is color coded. Uh, down here it's minus 100, and up there it's plus 100 radians per square meter. Now, those numbers may not mean anything to you. What does 50 radians per square meter mean? 50 radians per square meter it means a lot because that's the Faraday rotation of the us to the Crab Nebula pulsar, which is two kiloparsecs away in the galactic plane. So here at high latitudes, we're talking of Faraday rotations that are large, comparable to those you see in the galactic plane over for length scales of kiloparsecs. So these are big changes in Faraday rotation up here at latitudes of 30 and 40 degrees. So there's a lot going on Faraday rotation-wise at high latitudes. Before I get into the detailed comparison, I did want to illustrate the large-scale structure of these, and in particular, ask the question, do the Faraday rotations trace anything about the galaxy? and in particular galactic structure, like what is the direction of the field in the galactic plane? Well, here's zero, and it's hard to tell the difference between sort of positive and negative. So what I did was I made a separate image that looks like this, where the red ones are uh, positive rotation measures, the blue ones are negative rotation measures. Negative rotation measures mean a, a positive field that points away from you. And uh, this part of the galaxy is full of positive rotation, <laughs> negative rotation measures are therefore a positive field. And that is the conventionally accepted direction of the galactic field, of the magnetic field in the galactic plane. Uh, there are a few problems, like there's latitude zero, and at latitude strictly zero, well, it's kind of, this whole, this whole systematic thing has shifted downward. I don't know what the reason for that is. Anyway, I just wanted to show that before I got on to the more detailed comparison. And here's just a scatter plot of the Faraday rotation measure of the sources within a degree of where we've gotten good, solid 21 centimeter line Zeeman splitting results. Now, you can see most of the points lie either in this quadrant or this quadrant. That is, positive Zeeman magnetic fields associated with negative rotation measures, and that means with, that means the field directions associated with Faraday rotations agree with those of Zeeman splitting. Uh, and thanks, thanks to Tim, who pointed out that after 20 or 30 years, what I thought, or I wasn't aware of that discrepancy. And so I was never satisfied with the comparison between Zeeman splitting and Faraday rotation, but now I am, thanks to, thanks to Tim. So here are the nonconformist points in this quadrant and in this quadrant. And uh, maybe about a quarter of the points are nonconformist. And so what do they mean? The good thing about nonconformity is 
it forces you to ask some questions about why it's nonconformist, and this opens up your mind a little bit to, to uh, other possibilities. That's why nonconformity is really good and why diversity is really good. And we have to remember that, Donald Trump. Uh, oh, so this slide Tim already covered in great detail. So I'm going to now show you the nonconformist points and concentrate on them a little bit. Uh, they tend to cluster and uh, you, well, you can see that. But what I'm what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you the distribution of nonconformity in the North Polar Spur. That's radio loop one, and uh, I'm going to do that with hydrogen as a function of velocity. And before doing that, I want to remind you what the signature of an expanding shell is when you look at an image of the 21 centimeter line emission as a function of velocity uh, on a position-position diagram. And in particular, if you're the observer over here looking at this shell, this part, which is moving perpendicular to you, has zero velocity. And this part, which is the cap, which is moving towards you, has, in this case, negative velocity. That cap has positive velocity. And so at this velocity, you have a, a ring of emission in the position-position space. And the diameter of that ring increases as the velocity goes to zero. So here is a plot of part of the sky showing the North, Pol North Polar Spur section with galactic longitude, galactic latitude. And these are the points uh, uh, with measured magnetic field in the 21 centimeter line. And the red ones are the nonconformist points. And there's this whole group up here that are nonconformist. Uh, but then there's those two that are separated. Uh, one's conformist, one's not conformist. What's going on? Well, first of all, I'm going to flip through this quickly to show you the signature of the expanding shell in this region, which is very, very clear. So if I do this fairly rapidly, you can see that what you, what you really do see is you see this spherical thing, or this circular thing, which changes its diameter as a function of velocity. Now let me go backwards, just so you can see it again. That's very clear, I think. At least it's clear to me. If it's not clear to you, you should, you should become a theorist. <laughs> uh, but now let's look in a little more detail. Because when you look in a little more detail and go a little more slowly, well, let's see what we see we see that this shell breaks up into lots of little pieces. Uh, a lot of them are stringy. Uh, some of them are not so stringy. These points tend to lie in this feature, which is sort of a coherent feature all by itself at this particular velocity. And so maybe it's not unreasonable that this, this thing, which kind of looks like a, a self-contained feature, maybe it's not unreasonable that it has a field that is a different direction from that that you get from Faraday rotation, which integrates over the line of sight to infinity. Because this field is confined to this locality. So I think these nonconformists are teaching us that there are little places in the interstellar medium where there are little, I'm going to call them turbulence elements of the ISM and self-contained turbulence elements have their own characteristic magnetic field, which may differ in sign from that uh, of their surroundings. And in particular, the turbulence in this region is turbulence associated with a large-scale expanding shell. It's the same one that's blowing the ISM through the solar system, as Priscilla told us about yesterday. Uh, this shell is expanding at about 20 kilometers per second. Its major input is the supernovae from the SCO Association, which lie near the center. And what we're seeing here is the first degree of generation of turbulence elements from a large-scale flow. Turbulence is described always as a progression of energy transfer from large to small. And this is the first largest scale initial phase of turbulence 
in this expanding shell. And so I think it would be useful, maybe, for the numericists in their simulations to look, look at the initial place where the turbulence starts to develop and compare it with what's going on here in the North Polar Spur in our very backyard where we see that happening right now, and we have some magnetic field measurements to go along with it. OK. So, so that's, uh, I just sort of said that, so I won't. So uh, I'd like to then take that opportunity to study in detail the super double about which we know most, which is the Orion Eridanus super bubble. Uh, we have morphological information for all the components of the interstellar medium, and here they are in glorious color. This is a stereographic projection, which means that small circles on the sky translate into small circles. This is the so, uh, Orion Eridanus loop that looks kind of circular. And that means it's indeed a circular structure on the sky. Uh, here's the Orion Nebula, where all those stars in previous generations blew up and made this big super bubble, piling up gas in the inside uh, into the outside in this dense shell. The inside, the blue represents million degree gas, the hot ionized medium, the overpressure that drives the shell. This is the swept up gas. The red is from, is the warm ionized medium. It's ionized by the photons from these, these stars that make their way unimpeded across the 100 parsec diameter shell and ionize the inside of that shell. They get used up, leaving neutral gas on the outside, which is green. And in the middle, between the red and the green, I'll show you in a, in a minute, is a region where the Faraday rotation is really high, and that means there has to be electrons there and a high magnetic field, and the, those electrons come from uh, partially ionized medium, and I think it's ionized by the X-rays from the interior of the shell. Uh, so here's a reasonable model for that shell. Uh, it's got a magnetic field of uh, total magnetic field of 20 microgauss. And that's cons that really comes from Zeeman splitting measurements on the edge, uh, which we, we, we've done. Electron densities in the shell is 6. Uh, pressures of 100,000 centimeters to minus 3 Kelvin. That's not unreasonable for being associated with a high uh, pressure HIM on the inside. I want to look a little at the detailed structure of the of that shell. So uh, what I've done here is I've taken the, I've, we're going to focus in on this part right down here. And there I'm going to look at three regions, the outside, the transition region, and the inside. And uh, whoops. The, uh, the top shows H alpha, the bottom shows H1, and the uh, H alpha, and, and these rectangles, I'm going to show PDFs of Faraday rotation and H alpha emission and so forth in these three regions. Um, and also, we have plotted on here these colored dots, which are the Faraday rotation measures from the NVSS survey, uh, ranging from minus 100 to plus 100. And uh, outside here, they're all kind of uh, purplish, which is kind of down in here. There's a region here in the transition where they, they, become, uh, they become light blue. And then up here, they, 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 they kind of go back. So the difference, well, so rather than try and figure that out, let's look at the PDFs for those three regions, which I call the outside, the edge, and the inside. Uh, so here are the PDFs. First of all, the emission measure, the H alpha line intensity. Uh, for the outside, well, there's not much H alpha at all, so it's all pretty small. Uh, for the transition region, there's a little more H alpha. 
And once you get it into the H alpha shell, there's a lot of H alpha emission. For those regions, the Faraday rotation. Here's the Faraday rotation outside. And I think that just represents the spread of Faraday rotations of the extragalactic sources that, uh, that are in the sample. That is unchanged by anything in our galaxy. At the transition region in the edge, there's a large mean value of Faraday rotation, 50 radians per square meter. That's the same as to the Crab Nebula in the galactic plane. Over the space of less than a parsec, which is pretty amazing. And then once you get into the H alpha region, there's a large spread in, in Faraday rotation, but a zero mean. Pretty amazing. And the way you get that is by having uh, corrugations in the magnetic field. That gives you the randomness. Uh, it, gives, it can give you a systematic component near the edge. That's what you need to do. You can then uh, take uh, structural uh, structure uh, functions of the uh, of the uh, Faraday rotation and the emission measure, and they're all basically flat, which which means that the uh, structural variations as a function of angle are unresolved. And what that means is these changes in Faraday rotation and so forth are uh, are unresolved. So you got this shell around the outside of the Eridanus or Orion super bubble with large changes in Faraday rotation that are random over a very thin region. And then uh, outside, you don't have much Faraday rotation at all because there's nothing going on in the galaxy. And inside, the systematic component of Faraday rotation goes away, but there's a huge random component. And all these fluctuations are unresolved in angle. Amazing to me. So this is one single example of Faraday rotation and Zeeman splitting compared. Uh, how about the rest of space? Well, what I forgot to show you, what I forgot to show you in this diagram is, and, and, uh, made clear is, is the most important thing about this diagram. Uh, look at this region here. You see that line of purple points? It's real. It corresponds to a Faraday rotation of 100. And right next to it, we have light blue, which corresponds to a Faraday rotation of 0. We have a change in Faraday rotation of 100 radians per square meter over that tiny little angle. It's correlated over that. And this is radio loop three. And what do you know? It lies right on there. Here is, uh, there are other places like that where you see, and this one, this is, this is the one we just talked about, the Orion Aerodon super bubble. There's lots of structure in here of that sort of long linear nature where, where it just tells you that that must be the edge of a super bubble. But there's also these kind of blobs, red blob embedded among yellow. So that's a change of 50 radians per square meter. A purple blob, and there's a red blob from 100, plus 100 to the purple to minus 100 to the red, right next to each other. So, so the Faraday rotation has all kinds of structure in the sky. And this Faraday rotation has to be correlated with electron densities in the WIM. So this is not only a tracer of the morphology of Faraday rotation, it's also a tracer of the morphology of WIM. So now when we get to the end again, and I, I am actually almost done, believe it or not, uh, we have some of these questions about these WIM blobs. Uh, like, is the field at the interface of the WOM blob, is it perpendicular to the interface, thus allowing particles to cross? Or is it perpendicular to the interface, thus inhibiting particles from crossing? Questions like that we know absolutely nothing about. And here's another idea of how the uh, WIM should be distributed, namely on the outskirts of clouds in which 
in which the inside is, is, is atomic. Uh, I don't think we see this anywhere. Uh, we see it in the original McKee Ostriker uh, model cartoon. Do we see it in any simulations? I don't know. But I think what we really do need to do is get more Zeeman splitting data in order to understand these issues. And we need to get it in a mission so that we can select the directions in which we point. We want to point towards these turbulence elements in the expanding superbubbles and so forth. And the way to do that is to do it in a mission. And the way to do that is to get a telescope on which you can get years of time that won't fall down in the next windstorm. And there's, there's our man. He works here, and he's going to use that telescope for that project during the next decade. Thank you very much. OK, it looks like Alex gets the first question. <laughs> Carla, I'm not sure that I uh, would uh, buy this uh, idea that this non-conformist uh, points uh, uh, correspond to turbulence. To me, and I'm not observer, I don't have such an eye, but uh, they look uh, too much regular. In uh, all this non-conformist uh, points uh, correspond to the shell. So it should be, to my mind, uh, a regular change uh, of uh, magnetic field in the shell. So the, I mean the component that we see. So we can uh, discuss this probably later. How could this be? But uh, turbulence would, uh, I would expect uh, to have uh, fluctuations and changes of the direction if uh, but that's what we see no no you so we, we no 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 we you see very regular shell of this non-conformist point as if uh, the direction of uh, magnetic field uh, towards us that we are measuring changed their in a regular way rather than in a more fluctuating way corresponding to st a stochastic process. Sometimes we should see one direction, sometimes uh, no another. I agree with you. And what that, we only have about five points in there. And what we need is more measurements. And I think we'll see fluctuations, because we see turbulence elements in the shell in the 21 centimeter line, which have different shapes. Some of them are long and, and connected. Some of them are shorter, are smaller and shorter. Some of them are stringy. Some of them are more like little clumps. And that those, I, my interpretation of those is that is the initial breaking up of a systematic flow, the beginning of turbulence, the largest elements in the first stage of the transition of systematic flow to turbulence. Let's and discuss then, this, I think. <laughs> that will transfer to smaller objects. And in order to look at the field in those, we need lots of measurements. And that's what Tim's going to do for us. Okay, a few more questions. In principle, you could, if you could measure the actual velocity of those lines when you were making the Maybe you should wait for the microphone for just a second. Okay. Going back to your nice picture with yeah. uh, the expanding shells, mm -hmm. in principle, uh, if you had the resolution, you could measure the velocity of where you were emitting it. Oh, sure, you? we have so, that. So how does that work? I mean, you, you, should have show, you didn't show us how that was moving. Well, I showed you the movie. Right, that was and each a, of those panels at a, at a specific velocity. Right, but in your in your little blue and red dots, right. you didn't sh right. You didn't show us how the Zeeman splitting. I don't think you showed us how the Zeeman splitting was moving with velocity. No, I didn't. There's not enough data to really do that properly. We need more points. But it seems like it would be such a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah. To take a half a dozen points and mm -hmm. so you're going to do it, I guess. <laughs> Well, we're we'll going to do it, but we it. need more measurements, too. Actually, there's a related uh, work that Jennifer West and collaborators um, in Manitoba did, where they looked at sh uh, the shells of, super of, of uh, supernova remnants. And they saw there was a definite correlation between the luminous edges and the orientation of the global ma magnetic field in that area, because it was getting crushed. Mm -hmm. and intensified in a way that knew about the direction of the field, the emission. Anyway, yeah. we, I'll show you after. OK, any more questions for Carl? If not, let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs>